Good morning. So this is the the Porto Prize Conference on Competitiveness, uh, 2023, and the ICS, the, the Hitotsubashi uh, University Business School School of International Corporate Strategy, is organizing this. And I am also no Emi. Uh, I'm the professor and also the the chair judge of the Porto Prize. So I would like to. I would like to express my uh, exp ex appreciation to the sponsors, Morgan Stanley Securities, Ma Securities and also the K KPMG FAS. And also there are some uh, corporate uh, companies that cooperated with us, uh, PWC, Value Create, and thank you very much for your cooperation. And also uh, Professor Michael E. Porter from Harvard University, and also Ms. Uh, Professor Takeuchi Hirotaka from the Hitotsubashi University. Uh, they have been uh, giving us uh, great uh, pieces of advice as advisors. And also, we, as we act, uh, as we conduct our activity for the Hitotsubashi uh, University Business School and Porter Prize, and also I've been uh, supported by the members of the Hitotsubashi University. And it's been 23 years since the Porter Prize have been offered, and since its establishment, so the uh, uh, shareholders returns RE and also the RIC indicators are used to evaluate companies uh, businesses and also in 2011 Professor Porter uh, said that the creative values and sharing the value and in the competitive strategy, how to create values in the business, in the main business, and how to turn that into strength of a corporate activity is something that Professor Porter uh, advocated. And so creating the value is something that we are looking at in the price. And this is also used as the parameter to evaluate the companies. And this year, uh, there are many companies that received the support award using that perspective in their activities and so this trend will continue going forward and also i'd like to congratulate the companies that received supporters so iris oyama uh, jinushi company limited and also the charm and so we have the uh, interviews of the top executives of these uh, receiving countries. And so we have the Porter Prize Club and we continue to continue our conversation on how to create values and how to increase the values of companies. And we would like to return that to the society. So I'd like to conclude my remark here. And first, um, I am Noma from Hitotsubashi University and to all the winners, I would like to congratulate you on your achievement. And from my side, I would like to um, share with you um, the profit rate analysis of the winners. Now, um, what's unique about the Porter Prize is uh, that um, it's not just the result of high profit, but instead um, the originality of their strategy that led to that good result. Uh, but um, as uh, Mr. Besho or Mr. Be Okada mentioned, PBR, um, and also the profit margin um, is uh, something where we see a reflection of this original strategy. But, um, the four winners, of the four winners, three, Iris Oyama is not a listed company. So um, uh, there is no financial analysis, um, but as uh, Mr. Bisho has mentioned, over the past six months, um, TSC, um, um, at the end of March, um, it, they issued their PBR paper, and um, many companies are disclosing the MBO, Taisho, Pharmaceutical, Benesse, uh, as such um, uh, companies which are trying to delist. Now, why um, does uh, Iris Aoyama opt to not be listed. The current chairman is saying that um, if they were to do IPO, um, of course, um, uh, they can um, try to um, be, um, benefit um, the investors, uh, but at the same time, uh, they would have to uh, try to change uh, the foundations, um, 
spirit of the company, the founding spirit of the company. And um, in our first screening and second screening of the prize, we look into the consistency of the strategy the company holds. And I think uh, that um, deciding not to be listed, um, and this again is something uh, that which reflects um, the consistency of Oyama's strategy. Meanwhile, the listed companies um, and also, um, it could be that a company um, with, whose parent company is listed, um, um, and, um, that is uh, Jinushi, BizReach, um, and Unicham in itself is listed, but the PBR is above one fold. And the TSE and, um, and also METI's analysis say that um, the fact that there are many um, companies which, whose PBR is below one fold is a problem. It's not just the numbers, uh, but um, there are few companies which have a more than two-fold PBR in Japan. This reach or visual, um, it, it, PBR is about eight folds. Unicharm also is 4.2 folds. Um, so um, we see that they have a very high PBR. So we're not just looking at uh, the result, the profitability or PBR, that's not our yardstick, uh, but instead we look at the strategy. And I think strategy um, does lead to these financial results. I hope that you understand that. And I hope um, that uh, you'll understand through my presentation. And to the extent possible, why? Um, are these companies appraised is something I would like to communicate to you. Now, our screening standard, I mean, our first screening, we look at um, profitability and um, also uh, the value being offered with originality, consistency of their strategy, and innovation that supports their strategy. This is ROA and ROS. In the second stage of screening, uh, we look at um, the efficiency of capital and uh, the originality of value chain trade-off and the fit between different activities. Quantitatively, this would be ROIC. Well, uh, recently, over the past year especially, we see uh, that people are focused on ROIC. And um, many companies are introducing ROIC as a management benchmark or matrix. And from this perspective too, um, so, in other words, looking at um, their performance from a financial perspective, they are performing extremely well. And um, Jinushi, and from here and after, on the left-hand side, I'll show the ROIC, um, and on the right-hand side will be the ROS. And um, for each of the winners, I'll show the position, and also um, uh, the upper quartile, median, and lower quartile. And again, you will see... And then in case of Jinushi, uh, the um, operating profit margin is very high, the ROS. Next, BizReach. BizReach, again, you see that the ROIC and ROS are showing very high numbers. Well, Kusunoki-san uh, will uh, talk about the originality of BizReach's strategy, so that will be explained in detail later. Uh, but one thing I want to draw your attention to is that the ROS of BizReach is increasing year on year. So what I feel um, is unique about this is that business, BizReach's business model, it's a multi-site platform. In other words, there's a client and user and they're offering this platform. That is my understanding. Now, this platform in the middle. In the past, um, companies like Recruit, and this was done analog. So they had this analog approach. In case of Recruit, they have um, this um, Japan model. And um, well, um, this platform um, is um, being taken up by many companies, but when it comes to digital uh, platform, it is very easy for anyone to build, and it's difficult to generate profit from here. For example, a typical platform example, Uber or Lyft. So 
Uber, Lyft. Looking at the profit,、um, you see the numbers, Uber.、Um, they have、um, a revenue of、um, $31.8 billion,、uh, but、um, the net loss is $9.1. And um, also, um, Lyft,、um, their revenue is、uh, $4 billion, but the net loss is $1.5 billion. So、uh, they are generating revenue, but they're not making money. This is because. And this business model lacks originality. Anyone can enter this business, and the users, the customers, or taxi drivers, too. The switching cost is low. For example, those people who use Uber or Lyft using their app.、Um, um, I think、um, many users are using both apps. And they have both apps installed on, into their iPhone. And users really are not particular about using either Uber or Lyft. So, and from a business model or strategic point of view, there is little originality and it's easy to copy. And users and clients. Can switch easily switch from one to the other. So、um, it looks like a glamorous business,、uh, but in terms of the profit ratio,、um, they're not making any money whatsoever. But BizReach, when I first heard about their business model, I thought it might be difficult for them to generate profit. And I looked for their originality, what's unique about their business. But BizReach, you see the ROS is growing sharply, and it seems that they have this originality, unique approach model that is difficult to emulate. And I believe、uh, Sung Noki san will talk about this in more in detail. Next, Unicharm. Unicharm. Again, if you look at、um, the ROS, it's very high. Unicharms, what's unique about、um, Unicharm and what's、um, their strength and capability? Again, I would like to leave this、uh, to Professor Kusunoki.、Um, but、uh, from the financial perspective, what I'm focusing on in Unicharm is this.、Um, so it gives the total、um, net sales,、um, domestic versus overseas. The Japanese, come, the Japanese market. We are seeing the market shrinking due to aging of a society. Everyone knows this. But、um, when you want to expand overseas, there are a few companies which have managed、um, to increase the ratio of overseas sales while generating a high profit. I think Unicham、um, outperforms others. And And、um, so,、uh, when the current president became president,、um, I think、um, the overseas sales was about 30 billion,、um, but now it's about 600 billion. So,、um, and、um, domestic sales,、um, net sales is increasing, but the overseas sales is overwhelmingly high and growing. Well,、um, uh, there are different Com countries, markets overseas, there's a difference in preference. I'm curious to know how he tried to meet these different needs of different markets overseas. So, with this, I would like、uh, to conclude my analysis of、uh, the profit ratio. And once again, congratulations to all the winners. I am Kusunoki. Good morning. So, The Porter Prize evaluates and gives prizes to the corporate activities, and I think this is the best prize. And the reason is that this is the original prize. And I work in the area of the competitive strategy, and Professor Porter is the one who created this area of competitive strategy. And the Professor、uh, Porter defines the competitive strategy 
is to differentiate a co the company, your company, compared to others. And Porto Prize is different from other uh, prizes. And as Professor Noma said, it's not focusing on the business results, but rather the reasons and also the quality of the strategy that resulted in such performance of a company. And it takes a lot of effort uh, to evaluate and see the quality of the strategy. And so four winners strategies, why they are excellent and why they won the quarter price. So I will ask these questions to the top executive of these leading companies and the number of products on sale. So we'd like to go first to Iris Oyama at present, and Mr. Akiro Oyama. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And um, you are the first winner and to be interviewed, and I'd like to take that opportunity to congratulate you on this achievement. Well, um, even from my perspective, I think um, you have an outstanding strategy in place, and you've spent time and uh, tried to refine the strategy over a long period of time. And um, I think um, there are several keywords um, that will help us understand your company's strategy. Uh, first of all, you are a manufacturer and vendor. So you have the function as a manufacturer as well as a vendor. Uh, but you've combined this two, and you call yourself a manufacturer vendor. What's the meaning of this? Well, uh, we are a manufacturer to begin with. Um, manufacturing um, is... Um, the uh, um, company uh, where you are good at making things and the company develops as a result of that talent. But in the beginning, we started from plastic, from molding, and we did not insist on using that technology, but instead we developed plastic products. And then after, we entered into home appliance business so the starting point was manufacturing, and but um, we did not stick to that, but instead tried to sell what was in demand. That was key. And at the same time, the, well, we call ourselves a manufacturer vendor, but we need to have a vendor function. Another important uh, thinking is user in. We have to think about what consumers are wanting. We want to offer things that are wanted by consumers, not just making products and um, selling to retailers. Um, this is not um, the um, approach to be taken because customers will not take up your product at the retailer, but the retailers um, don't want a single product, but instead um, they want to have wholesalers sell a variety of products. And even though we are a manufacturer, we want to have this wholesaler function so that we can directly deliver products to the retailer. And there uh, we can get in contact with our customers and get feedback from our end users. And this leads to the next product. So though we are a manufacturer, it's not just uh, we have one function, but we are also functioning like a wholesaler, and that's the meaning of manufacturer vendor. Well, as you've come to appreciate from what you've just said, um, I think as a result of your business, your your business is expanding. But as I showed in this slide earlier, sixty percent of your products are new products. Well, in other words, um, um, products that came up in the past year, right? Well, three years. In our definition, it's three years, the past three years. Okay. So one after the other, you come up with new products. Well, um, well um, you have a lot of contact points uh, with your customers, and you get feedback, and you try to use this for developing new products, we normally call this market in, but no, you say user in. 
Well, I, it was hard for me to understand that at the beginning, but I think that uh, really um, sh um, sh is the crux of Iris Oyama's strategy. What's the difference between user in and market in? Market in includes the concept of user in. Uh, but in the real management, when we say market in, um, people are focused on the retailers, listening to the opinions of retailers. I think that becomes important. But they themselves, um, they are not a proxy of the consumers. In other words, um, the needs of the retailer and co consumers are not always the same. So listening to the retailers and thinking that that reflects the needs of the consumers, you might get it wrong. So who should we focus on? Well, the market is huge. It's a very broad definition. But what's most important in the market is the user, the consumer. And therefore, we're focusing on the consumer and user. That's the meaning of user in. And in order to achieve user in, we need to get feedback. That's important. But um, each and every employee and the developers need to think of themselves as a consumer. And in their daily lives, um, they might feel some inconvenience, new needs. They have to think of this on their own and try to provide what they think is needed to the market. So when we say market in, the market, quote unquote, is a cluster um, and you segment the market and um, say you are going to go after this market segment and uh, think about what kind of needs the people in that market segment have. So it's on an aggregate level that you think of this. and. Based on that aggregate information data, you try to satisfy uh, the needs. But user in, you focus on the individual, um, on the daily needs of the individual. Think about what they might find is valuable, this unmet needs of the consumer. We, on our side, the company, uh, tries to ident identify that and provide that beforehand. And a typical example is what? Well, um, a typical example, and what we say is um, the plastic boxes uh, to put in your apparel. And in the past, um, they were made of plastic, but they were not transparent. So coming up with a transparent um, plastic that you can see through, it helps you look for things. It will be more convenient if you can see what's inside from the outside. See it from the outside, okay? So if you just look at it, and if you have this plastic that you can see through, we thought it would be very convenient. And that is a typical user in example. And from there, a company grew significantly. Well, yes, that sounds obvious. But why did we think of it? Why was it that all the boxes uh, that we had to store these apparel were not transparent? Um, I think people did not want to show others what was inside. But from a consumer's perspective, when the season changes, you have to look for your sweater when it starts to get cold. You look for it everywhere and you can't find it. And so we put on this tape which said sweaters them to make it possible to identify what the box contained. So when you say those things, it becomes obvious, but no one notices until someone tells you that. There are a lot of things like that. And it's important that you're a manufacturer because back then, um, translucent um, box, that plastic material that you use for that box was not readily available, right? Well, um, yeah, it, the reason why the boxes were not transparent was because um, translucent plastic was not readily available. And it was, this plastic was very soft. So it, we didn't have any plastic that was hard enough uh, to be used for those 
boxes. Uh, but uh, together with the raw material manufacturer, we developed this new type of plastic. And finally, we came up with this um, raw material that was usable uh, for these containers or boxes uh, to carry apparel. And this was user in, and the manufacturer and vendor worked together closely. Okay, but it's easier said than done. And one after other, you through user in come up with new products which carry different value. I think that's a very difficult process, but um, it's installed in your company as a capability. How? Do you try uh, to um, identify these uh, new ideas and reflect that, incorporate that in your products? As I said earlier, our employees, especially those engaged in development, we tell them uh, that you are representing consumers. So you yourselves have to use different products and identify different needs or um, the discontent um, problems that the consumers are facing. So we repeatedly ask them to do that. And secondly, you have to do a lot of new product development. And we hold this meeting weekly on Monday um, around 9.40 to about 4 p.m. Every week on Monday, um, we talk about new products and the developers and salespeople well, um, from different divisions. They bring together new ideas, plans for new products. And at the meeting, I and the, all the directors will attend and make a decision on the spot. So we can do the development work very speedily. We have this mechanism in place. So go, no go. That decision for each one of them is done by the president. Yes. Ultimately, I am the person who gives the go and no go. For example, I want to have a new vacuum cleaner and... Um, you get the explanation that the consumer has such and such needs and we can expect to get this much sales. And I look at and listen to that explanation and then I say yes or no. I make that judgment on the spot. Um, but um, um, through this user in, when you come up with a new idea, it's very broad. You cover a lot of different categories. And you yourself alone have to make that decision. I think that is really challenging. But do you have an impl implicit um, by, um, yardstick within yourself? Well, of course, um, um, it's not that I make the decisions intuitively. I have a lot of market information. And based on that, I make an informed decision. But um, after repeating this process again and again, uh, this we come you come up with your own unique standard, and what's typical is um, whether the product presentation is easy to understand. It's the appearance, the price of the product, etc. And we have one thousand every year, and. Um, the presentation for each product is less than five minutes. I should, I need to be able to understand uh, the product just listening to the explanation for five minutes. Because at the store, customers don't time take to examine products. So uh, in less than a five minute presentation, at a glance, um, unless you can understand the product, um, it will the product will not sell. So um, it's because you. Make the decision on the spot. Uh, you can make the decision. And the more you look at it, you lose sight of what is good and bad. Of course, if I take time looking at it, I can deepen my understanding. Uh, but the consumers don't spend that much time in making up their mind. So every week on Monday, how many proposals um, do you look at every time? Well, um, at, at least 50. At most, 80 or so. And of those, what's the percentage of those that you approve? 
Well, it's not a single proposal uh, on which I make the decision. They, uh, they make a presentation, and well, sixty percent are yes. But within the yes, I give some um, instructions. So you read the process. It's a short presentation, uh, but um, you have to again and again um, improve the proposal in order to get it finally approved. Yes. It, initially, um, you, you talked about this translucent box, plastic box that was a hit. But what's the recent hit of o Iris Oyama? It's freezer uh, for the um, home use. Well, freezers, um, they did not exist at homes. Well, um, um, it's those big freezers um, that you know, open the box um, on the top for fishermen, those people who like to fish. But um, these days, in Japan, there are a lot of frozen food being consumed. Housewives, um, well, who are people in charge of cooking, require a lot of freezer space in their fridges, and they're struggling with that. So I thought we might make a product to meet that on that need. And in Asia at that time, um, I saw uh, this um, freezer, which looked like a normal freezer, and not the box type where you have to open the lid. And looking at that, um, I thought I sh we should do that because of the needs. But um, I thought it didn't match the housing condition of Japan. Well, the kitchen is uh, very small in Japan, and uh, we I don't want to have something sticking out. So in the next stage, I tried to make it thin. So, um, so it, it, not much depth, and so that it fits into a very small space and looks good. It fits right in, and at the same time, you, it can carry a lot of frozen food. Well, um, so this year, it's selling very well. When did it go on sale? It was this year, second quarter. Well, it's by sheer coincidence, I bought one. Thank you. Well, um, user in, so I should give my feedback. Um, we are an old couple. And I like uh, this Ajinomoto frozen dumplings. I love it. And I had no problem with my small fridge, but the freezer was packed all the time. And so um, when, when you, I buy these uh, frozen dumplings, my wife gets upset with me because we don't have any space in the freezer, uh, fridge. And I was on the verge of buying a new fridge, but we don't need a new fridge because of, we don't want the fridge part, we want the freezer part. So I, would, I bought that, your freezer. And um, a lot of, I buy a lot of your company's products, but Imabari Tao, um, and this towel which comes from a place in Shikoku called Imabari, uh, well, um, there's love, Cool Japan um, PR, but, um, Yes, um, Iris Oyama, um, you are using uh, this um, um, email body tell certified material, right? Yes. And I'm thinking of buying two. Iris Oyama is selling at half the price, so I bought four towels. So uh, this is a brand that the locals are very proud of, but how do you manage to do that? Well, we're making furniture and um, trying to provide different things for the homes. Towels also as a product is needed. So as a related product, we developed the towel. And well, um, when people say towel in Japan, everyone thinks of imabari. So I wanted to procure towels in imabari. And I talked with many people. And uh, to, from those supporters, um, they provided us with the towels. We also, uh, imabari is a brand. And we, it would be good if we could sell it at a high price, but we wanted people to, many people to be used it. So we tried to make it more affordable. 
So um, it's a joint work with the locals that led to this product that you're selling. Okay, thank you. Iris Oyama, freezer. Please try to search that on Google. Thank you. So we have Mr. Nishida from Jinushi Company Limited. Thank you very much for coming. And congratulations on winning the Porter Prize. Thank you. So there are four winning companies this year. So we interviewed Iris Oyama and Bizreach and Unicharm. And of course, many people have heard of these, the names of these companies. But when it comes to Genushi Company Limited, I think that many people don't know about your company, especially uh, since uh, you don't have this uh, B2C business. But your company name is really straightforward. So Jinushi, land owner company. So it's like you are aggressive business oriented person leasing land. So it's, I would imagine a real uh, landlord and also landowners. And uh, can you talk about the company. So we actually changed our company name to Jinushi Company Limited last year. And we paid attention to giving the idea of our business. So what we do is we invest in the land, not the buildings. And so I, we, and we receive the, uh, these we receive the price from the uh, tenants and we just lease out the land. So that means that, so you are a real estate company, but actually you are developing the financial product in the new area and you provide that to investors. Is that correct? Is my understanding correct? Yes. So based on the contract, we create a cash flow and we have this domestic pension and also insurance investors, and we provide the, them with the long-term financial products. So this is a new category that your company opened. So it is like a landlord business. That will be probably the most straightforward way of describing your company. But if you look at your business as offering the financial products, then of course, there are different types of products that investors can invest in. But so landlord were providing the financial products. So we have the rights, uh, limited property right of land as the financial products. And so we just lease the land and we created the new market and we expand that in the market. And Owning the building would involve a lot of effort and risks. And also recently we see the hike in construction cost and also labor cost and material cost to rise. So you would exceed the planned budget. And so that means that buildings. So buildings is the sort of a, the example of the instability so we just don't build the buildings, but we just leased the land. So it's like a bond replacement product. So that's how we understand the business. So that means that you have a high stability in your business. And actually your performance result shows, proves that stability. So Genushi Company Limited has high profitability. And that's one of the characteristics of your business. But when you think about this, as you said, rightly, why do did uh, people focus on both building and the land? But you are focusing only on the land, but why didn't people do that in the past? So 
in the a common sense of the real estate investment would construct the building so that you can leave the footprint on the map on the map and it is like a romanticism and but we are just focusing on the land as an investment target and we lease the land and we have this long-term contract and we receive the rent of the land and it is unconventional in the real estate business so the compared to the traditional real estate business maybe they have the traditional uh, real estate business focused on the buildings constructed on the land but if that building was not included in the business then it might be boring and people would wonder what you can do but actually you have this stable financial product development opportunity but so it is about how you decide the worth of the land is necessary and that might be different from the traditional real estate business what we put what we consider most important is that even when a tenant leaves we can still have the opportunity to lease the land to other tenants so we would look at the demographic trend of the area and also the population recent population and also the road constructions and we have the know-how in the last 20 years so we uh, emphasize the uh, land being compatible for different uh, convertible to different uh, purposes so your target clients are the commercial facilities and are you expanding that yes that's actually one of the reasons why we changed our company name so we focused on the supermarkets and drug stores and home centers located closely to residential areas and these are mostly our clients but since we changed our name to the landlord uh, the jinushi company limited so we started to see the social needs and hospice and healthcare and these are the kind of uh, clients and categories that we lease our land to and we have this 80% uh, of our business is about the, the supermarkets and drug stores and we would like to increase the uh, the clients in the infrastructure to 50% but if you switch the focus to infrastructure clients then you might have di you might need to have different views and how do you see uh, your performance recently? Well, we have the same basis for the business. So even if a tenant leaves, we can still make profits with another client and tenant. So if, so the landlord business and landlord services were not provided, then people might be in trouble. But so rather than, having investors uh, rather than having only investors as happy ones but i think that so the reasons and also the meaning for the, la the investors to have the landlord business what could that be so we have the the proposal or the off balance uh, proposal and also the new uh, development of the land so the tenant are looking for expanding their business so the, however they don't want to have this uh, fixed um, tax fixed asset cost but the real estate development sometimes force people out from areas and that could be that could cause instability but in our business we just focus on the landlord and we can in collect the investment from investors by focusing on the long-term contract and so that is actually the attractiveness of our business offering something stable so I think that the the real estate business would be like really aggressive and if I may say in an onomatopoetic onomatopoetic ways then then they're they tend to be really aggressive and just sell and sell so that's the image of the 
real estate uh, businessmen, but I think that you are not engaging in that style. So that's the value. And as you say, I think that what you say is very reasonable. And so you are creating new values to stakeholders. And also you are achieving high profitability and great performance. So probably, of course, uh, there could be many other players in trying to do the same business. And how do you see the environment of competition. So after the financial crisis in 20, 2008 and also the COVID-19 impact, our business is stable and it is obvious to uh, market of servers. So individually, we, of course, we see that there are companies that are investing aggressively in land but we are specializing in this area and also at the timing when the market was created we started focusing on the, the limited property right of land and also the real estate investment trust and we created them and uh, we were able to expand that to a certain uh, size and that is one of the reasons why we are stable and i think I mean, this area of competitive uh, strategy uh, study, and that sounds interesting. The reason why your business can maintain your competitiveness, I can think of two reasons. One is that you have created uh, the uh, limited property right of land business as a trailblazer, and you have accumulated know-how, and also you have great reputation in the market so people think of your company when thinking about the land lease and you are you succeeded because you are a front runner and so you are the only company in specializing in this but maybe as a side business maybe some people are doing this landlord business and uh, also the, as a side business, maybe some people might be bored with the kind of business that you are doing because you cannot emulate them. But probably your business is actually doing something that others are hesitant to copy. So we have the landlord uh, REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. And if we were in a half-baked way, then, then maybe some other competitors might think about uh, entering in the market and maybe they can uh, expand the wheat business in the limited property right of land but it seems like we had a good timing and we were able to grow our business and so in our group company i think that um, excuse me in i think that we are expanding our business by developing a new product in the landlord read. So we created the foundation for that. So that means that, so you are increasing the, the infrastructure client as well, in addition to the commercial uh, facilities. So it means that you are still starting. So we created the new market and we are, we still have more to go. And in addition to new development, uh, the, we have the existing, uh, existing buildings and existing land, and we will be able to contribute to uh, improve the uh, financial, uh, financial structure of existing businesses. So in Japan, the economy has already matured, but I think that your business has a sustainability aspect as well, and that would be meaningful. And from the social perspective, so the wage increase is a very important uh, talent, but so the wage increase is about the distribution of the work. So that means that the business owners must create new jobs. So a uh, company's profitability will become even more important. And your company is very aggressive and proactive on that. And also your company pays high salary to your employees. And I think your company is at the top, uh, some uh, 
standard. So the, uh, among the listed company, we offer the highest initial salary. And I think that you are, your employees are young. And also the, so what about the average age of your employees? Around 40. So the new employees, do you hire employees right after they graduate from university? Yes, uh, every year, maybe one or two persons. So, so for all the types of stakeholders, the competitive business will create the value. And I think your company is one of the following the typical example of that. So, so Genuity Company Limited, if many more people could understand what you are doing, then it would be also beneficial for the society. And I think that the Porta Prize will help you to do that. And thank you very much for sharing your time today. And that's the interview of the Genuity Company Limited uh, President, Mr. Nishida. President Sakai of Biz Region, and thank you for joining us and congratulations on your award, Port Award. We were just chatting, but I think you have some similarity with Jinushi. What are the similarities? Well, um, yes, talking about a competitive strategy. Well, we go after niche markets. We try to differentiate ourselves and focus on niche markets. Um, so I think um, that uh, we do have something in common with Jinushi. But initially, um, everyone thinks, what pe people think is niche, because you focus on that and you expand the business in that so-called niche market, it turns out to be that it's no longer a niche market. I think that's your company. Well, um, well, a professor put to some strategy is positioning. So um, what you do and do not do within industry, you have to make clear your position, your original position. This reach, I think, uh, is such a typical example. Well, um, you are um, trying to build a platform to match um, talent with the employers. So this is a general image that people hold. And um, looking at the labor market in Japan, um, yes, it is a growing market, but um, can you talk about things that you're not doing? I think that will make it clearer to us your positioning. So what have you opted out? Well, um, initially, when we started the business and now and things have changed, uh, but um, originally, um, it, uh, we focused on uh, trying to get talent that can be um, start working immediately, and the annual pay is very high. So um, this is something that differentiate us differentiate us from the beginning. So the target is different. Yes, you said ten million yen sal annual salary and above, and um, this is a professional market where the the talent um, can contribute to the business immediately. And as Professor Noma was saying, it's a platform. Well, yes, um, platform business. So you think of that it has high potential these days, but in reality, um, once it becomes um, digital, I think the entry point is very limited and it's not difficult, it's difficult to differentiate and it doesn't make much profit. But you are growing your business very profitable business. What's the difference? So um, you're targeted on this talent pool, which is very professional. Well, um, in doing the platform business, I think of that. Um, we, we think uh, that we need a platform because it's digital, but matching and ma do matching. But it's not always a good fit. So we have to um, listen to the companies and um, companies wanting to hire and also people seeking for a job. We have to listen to what they want 
And so we insist on listening to the voices. And um, based on this human value, we tried to develop this platform. Well, this platform business, the category, um, it's a um, um, byproduct of digital age. You can use um, digital, different technologies and have this platform. But in your company, I sure use digital technology, but uh, the order is you have to satisfy both the job seekers and the companies wanting to hire. And you need a lot of human resources and input. What do you do? Well, as you said, for example, companies, uh, they want to recruit um, talent. You have to listen to uh, what kind of people they're wanting to hire. Uh, in a platform business, uh, we think about which search items um, are needed um, in order to identify their needs. Because the ultimate destination for our business is um, that, um, well, um, the businesses can do it from uh, on their own, ultimately, if they learn. Uh, but uh, we um, try to support them because they won't be able to do it from the very beginning. And ultimately, we want them to be able to do everything on their own. So um, you try to stand by uh, the company and misreach personnel is in charge of the company and talks with the company to try to identify how the company can hire, recruit the person they're looking for. But meanwhile, for the job seekers, uh, you have to do good matching and you have to support the job seekers too. What sort of support are you providing? Well, naturally, um, in technology as a step, um, you have to uh, think about how to approach your customer. So, uh, but uh, to begin with, in our strategy, uh, we uh, thought of direct recruiting and um, so from the very beginning, we're searching for direct recruiting. But there's another element to our platform, another player, and that is um, the headhunter. And um, opening uh, the database into headhunters. And, and this, uh, thir there's this third party player, so an individual. Um, well, um, the head hunters um, really um, worked hard on this, and this led to our success at the platform. So, we it's thanks to the head hunters that have done their jobs that we are successful. Well, this region itself is a direct recruiting. So, unlike the conventional method, you're not doing um, the staffing um, or introduction of jobs, but there were headhunters in the past, and for them, BizReach value is what? Compared to the days when you, there was no BizReach. Of course, um, in doing staffing, um, we're functioning as a st staffing agent, and you have to gather people, and um, at each company, you try to um, try to gather, attract um, customers, not on an individual basis, uh, but you use a database. And so you have a certain quantity and uh, people of certain quality. So if you go to that um, database, you can identify people that they're looking for. So headhunters can use this database. You provide, you open up this information to headhunters uh, because um, by having many people engage, the value of your platform will be enhanced. So that's the crux of your platform business. So did you decide to open the database to the headhunters from the very beginning? Well, um, yes, um, we did disclose our database uh, to headhunters from the very beginning, but um, I think their priority went up uh, later because um, um, and we felt that the individual, individuals had difficulty doing everything on their own. And thinking about the customer service, uh, we wanted to rely on headhunters to assist us uh, where the individuals could not do everything on their own. The platform business. So which, you have to think about which side you're going to focus on. In other words, are you going to stand by the job seekers or the recruiters, the companies wanting to recruit? In this case, um, this reach is on which side or neither side? Well, the starting point uh, we um, uh, we targeted for the high uh, to be a high class 
um, recruitment site uh, with an I mean, annual income of 10 million. So we focus on the individual searching for jobs and you get them to pay from for the registration, right? From the very beginning. And so there needs to be, they have to satisfy them. You have to find them a good job for them to be satisfied. So you appear to be on the side of the job seekers, but you're not an agent for the job seeker, right? Well, um, now, well, we are currently a flat. We are a platform. We're neither on um, the company side or the re job seeker side. Um, so um, I think you have to think about your priorities, uh, but I think it's not priority, but the order. What do you do first? Uh, because you do something first, you can do something next and then after. I think um, this is um, what I think of a story of the strategy. And I think this is a crux. So you list up um, the things that you're doing, and your positioning and trade-offs. And once you list them up, it does appear to be original, quite unique. And still, it doesn't tell you why your business is growing and prop be being so profitable. So I think the order is quite interesting. Naturally, you use digital technology, but you use manpower to match both sides. The job seekers, they send, submit their resume, CV, and you give advice to them, right? And uh, there is the human input. Um, the job seekers can receive such uh, service from people, right? And that is part of our customer support. And in our case, um, we have the headhunters on our side. And um, so uh, we update the resume, CV with their assistance. So that in itself holds value. So um, even if you're not thinking of changing jobs right now, you want to appreciate what your value is and how you're seen from the labor market. And these people pay money to be registered, right? Yes. And for both sides, because you have this human input, and using human resources, uh, that it makes your e job easier, being able to rely on digital. But what's often said about this industry is everything will be unneeded. AI, if you input something to AI, the AI will give you the answer. And costs will go down significantly. We hear such stories, but is it possible to do everything digitally? I think that'll be difficult. Well, um, down the road, um, there could be such a future awaiting us, uh, but I believe that that will be difficult in running my business. To give you an example, um, for example, companies wanting to recruit and um, trying to automate um, the recruitment process. We are working on that, uh, but uh, in order to automate, you have to have a clear idea of the requirements of the person you're looking for. Can you automate that? That's difficult. You have to have a dialogue, and you ex that you have that have to have that company explain to you. We are faced with such and such, so we need such and such people. So there are uh, things um, that um, can be done automatically by the digital, but there are things that that humans have to do. I think humans um, have value, and I really feel that. So um, in order to have good matching. You have to define clearly the conditions that need to be met. And um, it's, you're dealing with people, humans. It's not a machine. So it's not as if you have a checklist and you say, we need this, that, and that, right? No. Well, that's obvious, but um, I talked about the order being different, important. Is it digital or analog, human? Well, it's not a choice that you make, but um, because people spend time and doing the groundwork, then after you can use digital and AI, it's not in choosing one or the other exactly. Platform. Well, um, there will be new entrants and the technology is changing. So there will be a large number of new entrants. AI will come in and BizReach. 
um, direct marketing platform might be disrupted, or some may say so. But to those people who say so, please counter argue and say it's not that easy. Well, it would be good if I could say that. Um, and so, um, um, well, this surprise uh, assumes uh, that you focus on the process which leads to success. Um, but um, we have to re examine our com competition strategy and uh, how we build our portfolio. Um, we have to think of that in our next phase of strategy building. Well, looking at the labor market in Japan, changing topics. I will reach 60 next year. From around that age, um, I think many people will start to look for new jobs. And the job, you, job seeker users at BizReach, do you see that age group increasing? Yes, naturally. Well, I don't know if it's at BizReach or the market that we see more and more such people. But um, yes, um, I think, um, it, it, well, but it is true that the number is increasing. I don't know if I can say this up openly, but Ms. at Ms. Reach, um, uh, the oldest person who found a job was 80. I was reading the newspaper, and those above 65 who are still working in Japan, well, Japan is overwhelmingly high against the other developed nations. And people are not reluctant to work. They enjoy working. Well, this does suggest that there is a potential, a promising future. Well, BizReach uh, was doing a lot of commercials. And you were focusing on young people, uh, people who want to build their career, and uh, changing jobs to build their career. That was the image of the commercial. Uh, but in reality, um, there is promising um, a market for the older age group trying to seek for a job after retirement. Yes, we do see a potential there, but um, careers, well, we, um, the longevity is 100 years. Um, so, and we could, out of the 100 years, um, eight work until 80. So um, it's difficult to think of just one single career. And that's the reason why for the young people, we talk about building careers. And for the seniors, uh, we say that they still have a lot of potential to work. So we are handling humans, not machines. And um, you have to uh, really build up the know-how to spill out the needed conditions to be met. I think the older age group will have will be required to satisfy different conditions from younger people. Well, um, is it possible for the job seekers to register free of charge? Yes, and you, so you come to understand something, right? So once you register, um, the companies and headhunters, well, they send in a scout, and you recognize that you have such talent, and then you're wanted by such and such companies, and people of the same age group as me, try and register. You'll see how the labor market sees you. With, with Professor Nomo, I'd like to <laughs> register and compete with her as to which of our, the two of us are, will be more popular. Thank you. So, President Takahara, thank you very much for coming and congratulations on winning the Porter Prize. So, in Pro Professor Noma's presentation, mentioned, so Unicharm is actually a hidden global company. In terms of the sales, 70% of it is actually earned outside Japan. And So B2B sales, like uh, semiconductor and electronics products, uh, these companies exist in Japan, but you are producing and find, uh, selling uh, consumables. And 
your business is globalized rapidly and also you are focusing on region countries and that's one of the characteristics of your business and of course the japanese market will saturate be saturated so companies say that they are looking for uh, growth markets that have growth potential but i think your company is very unique and i think that looking back you made a drastic decision but how do you feel about your decision and how your business progressed so far well, before that the porter price was established in 2001 and that's the year when i became the president and ceo and it's been 23 years and after 23 years finally i was able to be seated in this seat and actually we applied and we were not selected and as I listen to you, you have different uh, topics, and uh, the Unicharm was established as a company in, 19, in the uh, 1980s, and it was the rapid economic growth area, and we actually started out as a construction material company, and there were the storied uh, parking uh, buildings, and we procured the construction material called the panel and uh, that business didn't go well and we had about 30 years of history and we wondered what to do and as Professor Kusunoki said so we thought that Asia will be the market that has growth potential but you need to have the management resource the people and goods and money and what we did first was that including the establishment of the company there are so we had the different uh, remaining uh, remnants of the business in the diversification you were engaged in service as well for example the matchmaking for people looking for marriage partners and also we at the, the education for children and also tourism and we constructed the to towers at the time when the Seto Bridge was Seto Ohashi Bridge was constructed so we had our business diversified and we set our business and we organized and we pay back our debt and together with the employees that we had at the time we thought about the future in mid to long term and we created the plan and we selected the important employees and we we organized the portfolio and we set the mid to long term target plans and we looked at the demographics and we had this uh, the selection and also concentration and we looked at the demographics and in Japan after the rapid economic growth the number of children started to decline so we in Asia they had a lot of people but they didn't have the economic power yet so we went into ASEAN countries India and China and we're thinking about expanding our business in Africa but what we do in our business is not necessarily compli complicated but the key is finding the growth areas and moving into that area and continue doing that. And today, so you have this convergence of business and you use the non-woven fabric for absor create absorption and also the pet uh, area, the companion animal area. And what's interesting is that you are focusing on women and you create and increase the lifetime value of your uh, company's products. And can you explain that a little bit? Why did you decide to do that? So consumers include babies and also the elderly. And we manufacture and sell consumables. So we have this seamless uh, timeline to accompany consumers and that is actually efficient as a branding so we focus on women and because that 
it's not necessarily about the gender gap, but the idea that women come up with for companies like ours that manufactures the consumables, the women consumers are the ones who are opinionated and they would give us uh, feedback. And when you try to measure the trend, then women tend to be more vocal. And so I think that women have potential growth. So the efficient for the business and also the growth potential. So placing the priority and emphasis on women will be right for us uh, in terms of the uh, development of diapers and also the senior care, the elderly care. Even though we see the decline of birth rate in Japan, but I think that people are people don't have children uh, after they turn certain age, then they would have a pet animals. And I think that uh, women tend to uh, have this um, deciding power to create values. So women consumers tend to respond to you. And so the women oriented business. So I think that the lifetime value and people live through, throughout uh, this, uh, their lifetime and the, the final end users so for example, the diapers for the elderly, that means that uh, both men and women consumers would use it. So for them to spend their time comfortably without pain, when you think about that, then maybe the person who are, is giving the care, nursing care, might be the daughter, a woman. So you are focusing on that consumers as well. I think that the shoppers and users are different categories in business. And also consumers are not, all the consumers are not vocal or opinionated. Babies don't speak, pet animals don't speak, and the elderly, the seniors have difficulty speaking up. So there needs to be somebody who can translate their words. So. If, Babies don't say, I like Uniterm, please use products made by Uniterm. But so the product branding, the traditional way, you would communicate with a product at its center. So as Sunoki professor said that we are a hidden global company and the Uniterm corporate branding is necessary in this day and so our purpose and so we need to have this major banner and purpose and we need to appeal our corporate branding to our target customers so in order to maximize our value then i think that we will be able to increase our efficiency in that way. So we have the, the product brand uh, and the bottom-up mana to uh, create the branding in parallel. So your business itself is contributing to the society. And it seems like your company is a very noticeable and your business expands in Asian countries and emerging countries globally. So you will be able to solve many types of problems. And as I heard that you are creating a diaper to prevent the mosquito bites, the uh, diapers and also baby wipes, we use ingredients, uh, the herbal ingredients like lemongrass. Where did you launch that product? Where, so based on which country's demand did you create that product? So the dengue fever in hot countries and also the it's the it's uh, it is infected by the uh, mosquitoes and especially in Southeast Asia, and we when we started that we developed a program and started selling the product. So there was need. However, they didn't have economic power uh, to buy the products. So we started Malaysia and then expanded into Indonesia and Thailand and Brazil. And 
Brazil is in South America and they have mosquitoes and we have the anti-mosquito diapers and uh, baby wipes. And I found interesting when I heard about this is that the, the most lethal animal for humans is not the bear, grizzly bear, but uh, the mosquitoes. So solving the problems is done through your business activities and also on a global scale. And so you are implementing this business strategy and I think that you are, have the capability to actually implement that. And that is the key for your business. And I'm sure that you have such, you must put a lot of efforts in human, de human resource development. When we expanded our business in Asia, our human resources, our personnel, had history of working in a company for 20 years. So they are in the mid-level or they are in the uh, their early 20, 40s. And so that's these are the types of people who ha we had. So the, the, the marketers and developers and designers and also the accountants and also the factory production personnel. So there are five major important functions, and we wanted to have the employees who can actually have these five different functions in a self-sufficient manner, and and they were capable of executing their work, but they lacked experience of teaching their skills and knowledge to others. So they have this hidden knowledge, or so that. Uh, has to be made into an explicit uh, knowledge, or the implicit knowledge. And uh, Unicham has been doing that for a long time. So visualizing, and so standardize and visualize the hidden and e implicit knowledge into explicit knowledge that can be communicated. And on a weekly basis, so we had the, we, develop the strategy for 10 year strategy, five year strategy, three year, one year and six month strategy. And we had the format and we understand the current situation. And then we thought about the ideal situation and we created the specific plans to reach that, the ideal. And on a weekly basis, we executed that, the plan, and we had the PDCA cycle. And we found out why, the reasons why something went wrong. So the implicit knowledge uh, became explicit and also the standardized. So the employees who actually was just uh, working in a, as an ordinary talent uh, became more capable. And so that's the logic that we developed. And we developed the framework and that was expressed digitally so that even young employees, even though they didn't like it because it takes it was troublesome, but they were able to see it and use it. And they were able to make, they make uh, improvements and also make amends when something deviates. So it's like an OJT program and I think that people grow and develop on the job. So when they executed the, the framework on the job, then when they look back, they realize that they developed their skills. So we are we are manufacturers of the consumables. So I think that the, in terms of the competitors, we are not that different from our, our competitors. But I, just like the case of Iris Oyama, what consumers feel and the, what they have deep down in their psyche and how to um, visualize and uh, how to prove them uh, in a scientific manner. And we were able to find the ways to do that. And we reflect that in our product development and also product sales. And also we needed to have the employees who can actually implement that. 
even if you have a good idea, if your employees don't understand it, then it cannot be executed. So we have you have this common uh, framework. It must have taken a lot of effort. Of course, it is is a lot, and it takes a lot of effort for employees to execute them. And also, I think that it will keep creating results. But after you started that framework, how long did it take to see the actual results, making the implicit knowledge into explicit ones? And also, it took about 10 years. Young employees didn't like it. And so we had the directors and also the, uh, the uh, managing directors from the top level, we found the ways that it's easier, that it's easy to execute it. And we make sure that there is are no hurdles. And in the end, we executed that framework, uh, even overseas branches. So it's not only about how you position your company and also, you focus not only focusing on expanding your business internationally, but it seems like your example is is telling us how important it is to execute your framework and plan. So thank you very much and congratulations again. So these are the interviews of the four top leaders of the Porto Prize winning companies. And they, as I said in the beginning, the Porto Prize looks into the quality and also the originality of the strategy. And if you take pride in your company's strategy, please apply to Porto Prize. And thank you very much for watching. And that's the end of the interviews. And thank you very much, Professor Kusunoki. You've heard uh, the interview of the four winners. Um, I think um, the viewers came to understand um, uh, how they put the system in place, um, how much m efforts they've made into human resource development and the essence of all the processes that took place um, behind this success. Now, a Porter Prize um, um, is based on application. It's application-based. It's only after you apply that you can win the prize. And we also um, introducing, not just introducing uh, the cases of these winners, uh, but to all the applicants and through the process of screening, we give our feedback um, and engage in dialogue so that we deepen our understanding towards the companies and also the applicants uh, through this process, we hope, uh, will gain something. And so that is the how we operate uh, this prize. I hope that you apply. Um, Normally, um, after the Golden Week for one month, uh, we um, have um, this period where we accept applications. Uh, today, I would like to thank you for your precious time to attend uh, the Porter Prize Conference on Competitiveness. And uh, for the uh, uh, winners, um, I think um, it will take a few time, a few days, uh, but we will put up. Uh, video of the winners and also uh, written materials and all the of us here a business review uh, spring edition uh, we will put an article on the winners and this prize um, and I think um, uh, the, um, and there's also the archive that contains the records of past winners please access that archive too thank you very much <laughs>